வணக்கம் வென் யூ கெட் அ பேஷண்ட் லைக் திஸ் த இன்ஜுரி இஸ் வெரி ஆப்வியஸ் தேர் ஹஸ் பீன் அன் இன்ஜுரி டு தி எக்ஸ்டென்சார் டென்டன் இன் ஜோன் ஃபைவ் ஸோ ஆல் வி நீட் டு டூ நோ இஸ் கிளினிக்கலி எக்ஸாமின் த பேஷண்ட் ரெக்கார்ட் அண்ட் டாக்குமெண்ட் த ஃபைண்டிங்ஸ் தட் ஆர் ப்ரெசென்ட் டூ அ நீட் டிப்ரைட்மெண்ட் அண்ட் அ கரெக்ட் டெண்டன் ரிப்பேர் யூசிங் த கரெக்ட் சூச்சர் மெட்டீரியல் அண்ட் டெக்னிக் ஃபாலோ அப் டெலிஜென்ட்லி அண்ட் கெட் குட் ரிசல்ட்ஸ் and wouldn't it be great to know exactly how these are done that is exactly what is going to be shown in this video the management of extensor tendon injury in zone 5 zone 5 injury represents injury to the extensor apparatus over the metacarpophalangeal joint of the fingers At this level there are two important structures that can be injured let us consider the gross anatomy of the extensor tendons at the level of the metacarpophalangeal joint this represents the end on view of the metacarpal head at the level of the metacarpophalangeal joint the extensor tendon is placed on the dorsal aspect at this level on the volar aspect we have the volar plate of the mcp joint and the deep transverse metacarpal ligament on either side from the dorsal aspect of the volar plate we get two bands of tissue the sagittal bands which run dorsally around the joint capsule to encircle the extensor tendon on the dorsal aspect so injury to the extensor at zone 5 can involve injury to the extensor tendon per se or injury to the sagittal bands the injuries to the extensor tendon will be considered in this video and the injuries to the sagittal bands in an upcoming video we shall deal with the extensor tendon injuries with regards to the presentation the anatomy the biomechanics the evaluation and the management these injuries usually present as open injuries due to lacerated wounds or incised wounds following industrial accidents road traffic accidents or self inflicted injuries punch injuries or what are known as fight bite injuries where the patient's knuckle hits the tooth of the opponent and results in an injury to the extensor tendon and a contaminated wound and the extent of the injury may be complete as in this example or partial as in this case as mentioned earlier the anatomy of the extensor tendon at the level of the metacarpophalangeal joint is quite simple we have the extensor tendon on the dorsal aspect of the joint the radial sagittal band on the radial side the ulnar sagittal band on the ulnar side the radial sagittal band is usually the thicker structure we have the interosseae and the lumbricals on the radial side and the interosseae on the ulnar side on the volar side of course we have the volar plate and even volar to that are the flexor tendons and the fibrous flexor sheath Sometimes we come across a patient with a partial cut of the extensor tendon. Is it necessary to repair these partial injuries? If we consider the biomechanics of the extensor tendons, even with a 25% cut of the extensor tendon, there is an average loss of about 6 degrees plus or minus 7 degrees, which comes to almost 15 degrees extension lag with a 25% cut of the tendon. and it goes progressively up till about total cut when the extension lag is around 35 degrees the evaluation of the tendon injury must begin with a good clinical examination examination of the wound will show it to be one of the three types that is a lacerated incised wound like this or a punch wound otherwise known as a fight bite injury or an infected wound like this or a wound with skin loss which may involve tendon loss also in testing the movements looking for extensor tendon injury it is important to remember that the test must be performed in this way the hand of the patient must be kept flat on top of the table with the palm downwards and the patient must be asked to lift the tested finger up to look for the integrity of the extensor like the index middle ring and little fingers by asking the patient simply to extend the fingers when in the air will give a very false result after clinically assessing for injury to the extensor tendon a plain radiograph may be required to rule out any fracture or foreign bodies an mri may be required in the rare event of a 
closed injury where there is a rupture of the extensor tendon. The management of such an injury would depend on the type of wound, whether it is a lacerated or incised wound or a punch injury or an injury with loss of skin or tendon. When it is a lacerated or an incised wound causing an injury to the extensor tendon in zone 5, the detailed surgical technique is described further on in this video. In a punch injury or a fight bite injury, there tends to be a lot of biological contamination of the wound. Hence, after an x-ray to exclude fractures of foreign bodies, good irrigation and exploration of the wound needs to be done, antibiotic prophylaxis needs to be started and the wound needs to be left open and only a resting splint applied. Once the infection reduces, secondary suturing of the skin needs to be done and after 10 or 14 days, a delayed primary repair of the tendon can be done. If the wound has not healed by this time, it will need to go in for a secondary reconstruction later. When we encounter injuries with loss of skin or extensor tendon, the priority is to provide a cover either by secondary suturing if the wounds are very small like these friction burns which can be excised and closed primarily or a flap cover like in this patient where the skin cover is provided with a reverse dorsal metacarpal artery flap. After these wounds heal, a delayed primary repair or a secondary reconstruction of the tendon may be done provided the joints are soft and supple. Let us now see how the extensor tendon repair is being done over a knife that had been kept for cutting coconuts. Clinically, he appears to have a total cut of the extensor tendon on the index finger and a partial injury to the extensor on the middle finger. In addition, the joint that is the metacarpophalangeal joint seems to be open on the index finger which indicates that the capsule also has been injured. X-ray has revealed no fracture or foreign body. Before going ahead with the surgery, we need to remember that all the five basic requirements as required for any basic hand surgery are needed. Good anesthesia, good lighting, good magnification, good tourniquet and a good technique. When we talk about the anesthesia required for the extensor tendon repair, a regional block or general anesthesia is preferred. A regional block in adults and general anesthesia in children. Some people tend to use local anesthesia for doing the procedure. But there are certain drawbacks of local anesthesia. It is not possible to use the tourniquet for a prolonged period of time when under local anesthesia. There is a need for extending the incisions for access and local anesthesia needs to be given for these areas also. There may be a voluntary pull of the muscles by the patient while suturing the tendon and this may make suturing very difficult and patient can also feel the pull of the muscle while we are suturing the tendon and this may give a sense of discomfort for the patient. Once the anesthesia is given, the tunique is raised and the wound is explored. Here for the index finger, the extensor tendons that is both the EIP and EDC are found cut and the capsule is also found cut, that is the capsule of the metacarpophalangeal joint. It is the thicker structure underneath the tendon. For the index finger, the injury to the extensor tendon and apparatus is almost complete, but for the mid finger, it is only about 75% cut, as can be seen. Now, access needs to be obtained. This access is not only for retrieving the proximal end, which is not much required here, as the tendons do not retract much but also for providing a good suturing of the tendons. Here the incision is made proximally for about 2.5 cm and the raised skin flaps on either side are retained with stay sutures. Now the structures are identified comfortably. That is the proximal end of the cut extensor tendon of the index finger and that is the distal cut end of the index finger extensor tendon. Underneath you can see the joint capsule. The layer of hematoma around the cut ends of the extensor tendon must be excised for clear visualization of the extensor ends. After excising the hematoma and getting hemostasis, we can have a better visualization. Now we can see the 75% cut in the mid finger extensor and this is the extensor of the index finger the distal and the proximal ends 
and the joint capsule that is the tendon proximal cut end of the tendon the distal cut end of the tendon and the joint capsule underneath as we retract the distal cut end of the extensor tendon to the index finger we can see inside the joint space of the metacarpophalangeal joint as the capsule has been injured a thorough wash is given and then the joint capsule is repaired by picking up with toothed forceps the ends of the capsule and repairing with a horizontal mattress suture using 4-0 polyamide suture taking care to place the knots outside the capsule. This is an important step that is reconstituting the dorsal joint capsule as otherwise it will not be stable enough to allow movements and gliding of the repaired extensor tendons. You will note that there will be some attachment of the extensor tendon to the joint capsule and as we pull the joint capsule for repair the extensor tendon also moves along. The important things to remember while repairing the joint capsule there should be no overlap of the two ends otherwise the capsule may become too tight. The knot should come on the outside. While the repair is being done the finger must be supported by the assistant and no part of the suture must include any part of the extensor tendon. Again a thorough wash is given with saline and the extensor tendon is then repaired. I have used 3-0 polypropylene suture with horizontal mattress suture through the extensor tendon. Good alignment of the extensor tendon should be achieved along with good strength. While this repair is being done, it is good to minimize the handling of the tendon with the forceps and even when handled with the forceps, we need to use a very gentle technique. Continuous support of the finger by the assistant is very important during this process of suturing of the extensor tendon. There should be no overlap of the tendon also after the suturing has been done. Now the transverse cut portion of the sagittal band is repaired also with 3-0 propylene but with simple sutures. A horizontal rent in the sagittal band is not a big problem but a longitudinal tear is definitely a problem as it will lead to dislocation or subluxation of the extensor tendon as we shall be seeing in the next video on sagittal band injuries. In a similar fashion the ulnar side sagittal band is also repaired using 3-0 polypropylene simple sutures. Having finished the repair of the extensor tendon and sagittal band on the index finger now the extensor tendon and sagittal band of the mid finger are being repaired. Please note that I am not using the forceps to hold the to grasp the extensor tendon but instead using it as a support to take my bite. Even when I do grasp the tendon I make sure to hold the extensor tendon on the lateral aspect that is at the level of the sagittal band rather than in the tendon proper. This is to avoid any necrosis of cells on the extensor tendon which may lead to scarring and adherence to the overlying skin. We also need to remember that the bite we take on the extensor tendon must be a minimum of 1 cm from the edge so that a good purchase can be achieved. Now the skin suturing is done. Straight skin sutures are applied with vertical mattress sutures. There is no need to put subcutaneous sutures. A drainage tube must be placed since there is a lot of dead space and hematoma can occur. A pad and bandage dressing is applied and a POP is applied. A below elbow volar slab POP with the wrist in 30 degrees of extension, metacarpophalangeal joints in 30 degrees of flexion.
and interphalangeal joints straight. This POP immobilization is continued from 0 to 4 weeks. The removal of the POP slab is done at the end of 4 weeks. Between 4 and 8 weeks, there are certain important instructions that are given. Scar massage and active mobilization only off the table and active flexion exercises with total straightening splint for the metacarpophalangeal joint of the involved finger to be worn at night. After 8 weeks, passive flexion mobilization and strength training for extension can be started. This is the condition of the patient for whom we have demonstrated the surgery at about 5 weeks after the suturing. The POP has been removed one week back and you will see that there is just a flicker of movement that is lifting the index and mid fingers off from the table. One week further down the line, we can make out an improvement in the extension of the index and mid fingers and we can also palpate the movement of the extensor tendon over the dorsum of the hand while the patient is attempting extension. Scar massage also needs to be emphasized at this stage as you can see there has been a minimal superficial necrosis of this flap of skin that we had raised. Active flexion exercises for the fingers should also be encouraged. This is the result at the end of 8 weeks following the suturing of the extensor tendons of the index and middle fingers. Strength training can be started now and if there is any deficit of flexion, passive flexion range of movements can also be started now. Injuries to the sagittal band which are also a part of the extensor tendon apparatus in zone 5 will be dealt with in a subsequent video. I hope you liked the video. I enjoyed making it. Please click on the shown links to see more about the other extensor injuries and the zones of extensor injury. And do not forget to subscribe to stay connected with the latest in learning and surgery, plastic surgery and trauma surgery. Panakkam.